Coming up this evening on NTD Business. Twitter's largest shareholder, Elon Musk, making a U-turn, deciding not to join Twitter's board. Despite the war in Ukraine, some investors seem to be benefiting from the sudden sell-off in Russian government bonds. Parts of Shanghai erupting into protests amid the lockdown. Some residents say they're starving to death. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Paul Graney here live from New York City. Elon Musk has apparently turned down an offer to sit on Twitter's board of directors. Some view Musk's recent decision to invest heavily in Twitter stock as an attempt to fix a company that's engaged in censorship and alleged discrimination. Twitter CEO says it's a good thing Musk turned down the offer. He was supposed to be officially appointed to the board Saturday morning, but instead, he told Twitter he changed his mind. We don't know why exactly. If Musk had joined the board, he would only be able to own 15% of Twitter's stock. Now that he's not joining, he could potentially buy up even more. Sitting on the board would also limit what Musk could say in tweets. One Silicon Valley insider told us Musk is more influential behind a keyboard than sitting on a board. Twitter has banned high-profile users like former President Trump and independent journalist James O'Keefe, leading many conservatives to say Twitter is discriminating against them. And a group of environmentalists are causing quite a stir on Twitter. They are calling on people to join something called the SUV Flat Tire Challenge. They want people to find SUVs and let the air out of their tires. The group is called Adbusters. It says SUVs are responsible for a big share of global carbon emissions. And quote, this is to quote, drive the urgency of this climate crisis home. They tweeted step-by-step instructions to deflate the tires, as told people to a work group, hit rich neighborhoods first, and avoid vehicles with disabled stickers. Some Twitter users say their deflating tires could lead to accidents. Others say this could go sideways real fast, as some vehicle owners could call the police, even have a gun. One person apparently, an SUV owner, said they've driven an old SUV for 10 years since they can't afford another car, and asked the group to pick on someone else. An association over 2,000 state legislators wants to take the politics out of pension fund investing. The American Legislative Exchange Council says state pension funds are investing your money in businesses for not for financial reasons, but to advance political objectives. It's come up with a new framework to prevent state funds from engaging in so-called ESG investing. That stands for Environmental, Social and Governance-Based Decision-Making. Quote, politically motivated investing is what Alex Jonathan Williams calls it. I asked him to explain. Well, we've seen really a proliferation of uh, many activist type investor uh, ideas go across uh, many of the progressive leading states, at least in recent years, meaning that uh, they're taking people's hard earned retirement dollars in public sector uh, defined benefit pension plans. And so for police uh, and fire, for teachers, for state employees, and in many cases, those funds are being used uh, to divest or invest in politically based causes versus investments, let's say, that would maximize long-term rates of return. And Paul, as you and I have talked uh, many times, these unfunded liabilities that are building in the states and have been for many, many years, we document that at ALEC every single year, the trillions in unfunded liabilities. Uh, Guess what? This politically based investing scheme that's out there in many places now is only making these unfunded liabilities that much worse. And of course, hurting workers and retirees and hurting all of us as taxpayers who will be expected to pick up the tab uh, when these bills come due. What are some of the standout examples of this politically motivated investing? Well, you know, historically, uh, going back a couple of decades, there was the movement in the late 1990s and early 2000s to divest from tobacco-related stocks. And uh, we saw, for instance, I think California was one of the main examples of that. And uh, there was really studies done that showed California pension systems lost uh, hundreds of millions, if not a billion or more, in foregone returns after they divested from tobacco stocks. And more recently, there's been the push, uh, let's 
let's say in states like New York, I believe Maine, uh, or Vermont, and several others to look at divesting from oil and gas stocks uh, or coal or anything that's fossil fuel based. And then you combine that with efforts, let's say, to go after any other politically targeted industry, whether that is in an anti-gun state to go after uh, gun manufacturers or anything that might run countercultural to that prevailing state capitals uh, politics. So how do you handle funds that don't want to invest somewhere like Russia or China for obvious reasons? Well, I think that's a totally different uh, question when it comes to policy, and it's something that we have written about, let's say, for years at ALEC. Uh, we have a whole publication called Keeping Politics Out of Pensions, where we really focus the attention on these politically motivated investment schemes that we're talking about today as it relates to uh, going after fossil fuel, going after gun manufacturers, going after tobacco-based stocks. Having a national security-based discussion is a very different topic, and it's something that if a, a nation or uh, is, is deemed as an enemy of the United States or as a terrorist uh, nation, that uh, that's a totally legitimate conversation around states divesting their pensions uh, from those for national security reasons. What we're talking about is pure politics and uh, whether that is being played against one industry or another or one individual company in some cases, uh, that's a very different uh, story. This type of activist investing, you think it comes from ideologies within the funds themselves? Does it come from political pressure? Well, I think it comes from many sources, right? And in some cases that the legislators promoting this type of legislation in some of the states I talked about, like New York and Vermont and, and Maine and others, are being pushed by maybe constituents from the far left in their districts. Also, you have the scenario where you have states that have internal money managers that may be putting their uh, personal political views, let's say, ahead of the long-term rates of return on the investment funds. Or in some cases, states contract out the management of their pension investments. And you may have the outside money managers uh, who have a stated goal of producing some sort of non-financial return, uh, read politics in many cases into the scenario, and they dictate that uh, and will go forward and, and take those strategies forward from their outside investment perspective. So these threats do come from multiple sources, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's really a huge issue in that there are trillions of dollars at stake here that states have under management and their pension systems. And if somebody doesn't address this, I think this problem only gets worse, not better. Jonathan Williams, American Legislative Exchange Council. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, it was great to join you, Paul. And Russia isn't going to raise money from foreign investors for the rest of the year. Fewer people are willing to lend it money now since it invaded Ukraine. And that's made it incredibly expensive for the Russian government to borrow money by issuing new government bonds. In fact, most investors are trying to offload the Russian bond holdings, fearing Western sanctions will make it hard for Russia to pay back its debts. The Kremlin says it has the money, but claims the West is intentionally preventing it from making payments. The U.S. and its allies have frozen Russia's overseas foreign exchange reserves, which can be used to repay the loans for freezing these assets. The Kremlin says it will sue the West, admits it won't be easy. Anyone could be holding Russian bonds right now. American pension funds, even individual foreign investors, could be at risk of losing out. President Biden said that freezing Russia's foreign reserves limited Russia's ability to fund its war in Ukraine. There's no indication that U.S. policy will change. Some investors in Wall Street banks have apparently benefited from the fact people are so desperate to sell the Russian debt holdings. They found what looks like, on the surface at least, a no-lose bet. Thiris Khan Fredrickson has more. Banks and Wall Street firms are still trying to profit off of Russia, despite the social atmosphere, and they're trying to do it by buying Russian debt. The bonds were knocked down in value because of excessive selling, and so many were pressured in the United States and the West to liquidate any Russian Holdings. William Stack is the owner of Stack Financial Services. Stack says all the selling drove bond prices very low. Meanwhile, Stack believes it's highly unlikely Russia will default on that debt. Russia's debt to GDP ratio was around 18% in 2020. Where you can literally buy something that normally costs a dollar and you can buy it for 20 cents. And there is the possibility that years from now that that 20 cents may be actually worth uh, a full dollar if they don't default. I mean, that's amazing, you know. 
quadrupling possibly. Don Kaufman is the co-founder of Theotrade, an online financial education service. Kaufman says that they can still win if the bonds default. The exact same time you can buy basically an insurance policy. That's what a credit default swap really comes down to. Normally, there is no way to profit from buying insurance. But right now, Russian bonds are falling faster than the insurance. So in summary, default or not, the investors can make money, but other factors still make it risky. This is not a safe trade. Uh, even with the credit default swap on there, again, times of war can bring, you know, untold risks. Firms involved with this include Discovery Capital Management, Aurelius Capital Management, Golden Tree Asset Management, Silver Point Capital, and H2O Asset Management. Big banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs are facilitating these trades. It's uh, simply a desire to, to make profit. And, you know, before we point too many fingers, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, they're their investment portfolios are owned by Americans, so we'd have to spread the guilt out to anyone that's that owns those funds as well. J.P. Morgan representatives say that none of the trades violate sanctions or benefit Russia. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. And a baby formula shortage in many parts of the United States is forcing retailers to ration their supplies. Walgreens is limiting shoppers to three infant and toddler formula products per transaction. A recent review of supplies at 11,000 stores indicates that nearly 30% of popular baby formula brands may be sold out. Cities like San Antonio and Minneapolis are reporting out-of-stock rates for certain formulas even higher than that, well above 50%. Part of the problem stems from an Abbott Nutrition recall in mid-February for select lots of Similac and other formulas made in Sturgis, Michigan. Manufacturers are ramping up production to make up the difference, but admit it may take weeks for them to catch up. Food is even shorter in Shanghai during its now week-long lockdown. That's led to a rare sight for China, people publicly protesting authorities. Many are tired of the lockdown, others are just desperately short on food. And just a warning, this story contains some graphic video. Anthony's Don Ma. A Shanghai resident yells in despair out her window. She's shouting, help us, we're close to starving to death. Help us now, we're really close to starving to death. A famine in China's richest city sounds unbelievable, but that's actually what's happening. A large number of Shanghai locals are facing the same situation as the woman. It's led to something rarely seen in Shanghai. Residents are gathering to protest against authorities in streets and from buildings. This last clip was from protests from Shanghai's Kangting district. A local there told us on the phone that it's not just her district that's seeing protests. We really have little to eat. We really can't find any food to buy. I'm a pregnant woman as well. Last night, it wasn't only in Kangting district. Many neighborhoods were protesting. They all made a big commotion. So what was the response to the protests? In one district, authorities sent a drone there to broadcast a message to residents. Just how desperate are some people for food? One Shanghai local called the police asking whether there would be food if he got himself arrested. I'm not looking for trouble. I just want to ask, if I run outside now and you arrest me, will I have food to eat? I've had nothing to eat for four days. I only have tap water now. Unfortunately for some, the situation was too much for them to bear. Footage shows a number of residents' motionless bodies on the ground after they chose to end their own life and jump off their apartment buildings. Don Ma. NTD News. And just today, the White House warned that extraordinarily high levels of inflation are on the way. As not just the U.S., 
Over the weekend, thousands of Peruvians took to the streets of Lima, protesting against the spike in fuel and fertilizer prices, as well as demanding that their president resign. This is the second week of protests in Peru. One protester said, quote, this is communism, and if you don't go out and fight for your freedom, everything will be worse. The protests represent the harsh reality for Peru's leftist president, Pedro Castillo. This week, it declared a curfew in Lima to stifle dissent, which thousands defied, taking to the streets in protest. Peru has declared an emergency for its agricultural sector due to rising fertilizer prices triggered by the war in Ukraine. But like many countries, Peru was already battling high inflation before the war. In March, inflation hit a 26-year high. Back at Wall Street, stocks closed sharply lower today. All three major indexes ended deep in the red. The Dow fell 413 points, one and two tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 lost 76 points, one and seven tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq dropped 299 points, two and two tenths of a percent. The benchmark 10-year Treasury yield hit 2.772, nearly a three-year high. All eyes will be on inflation tomorrow when we get the latest number when the Labor Department releases its CPI report. And crypto-focused funds are seeing the largest weekly outflows since January. Over $130 million were withdrawn last week, mainly from Bitcoin-focused funds as investors started taking profits, perhaps. It's the second-worst week this year for net outflows in crypto. It's after Bitcoin rocketed from 38000 to 48000 just the two weeks prior. Bitcoin just dropped below 40000 again for the first time in weeks. That's still to come this evening. Blue-collar workers are sharpening their tech skills and finding new higher-wage jobs. All this with no college degree needed. And the war in Ukraine is making something unexpected and pretty popular. Farmers are turning to animal waste as fertilizers become hard to find and more expensive. That and more coming up on NTD Business. Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and MyPillow. Well, during these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my standard size MyPillow, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size MyPillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98. Or my king size, regular $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm gonna include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. Oh hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. Yo, camping buddy. Okay, you guys ready? Dude, I thought you were driving. I thought you were driving. Oh, I never said I was driving. I I definitely can't drive. (laughs) If you're high, just don't drive. It's illegal everywhere. If you feel different, you drive different. Welcome back. 
You know, it's not just blue collar and white collar anymore. There is also the new collar. It refers to blue collar workers who upskilled during the pandemic to get better paying jobs like tech jobs with no college degree necessary. Anthony Shaw Marshall has more. Many blue collar workers are turning into new collar workers, individuals who develop skills needed to work in higher wage industries without a four year degree. Hiring expert Ira Wolf says the pandemic really changed things. Uh, all of a sudden they realized that they can go home at night and hook up to even an MIT um, or a Stanford University or Harvard and get a level of education, a quality education for free taking classes at many universities. People are avoiding strict office environments and transitioning out of industries where they might be replaced by an automated device. An Oliver Wyman consumer sentiment survey found that about three quarters of pre-pandemic blue collar workers are upskilled in the hopes of finding better work. The hybrid works here to stay uh, and, and not that education's going away. No, you're still gonna have to go to school. What education looks like and what continuous learning looks like is gonna be very different. As soon as a child is old enough to read and use a computer, they can learn coding off the internet. Despite having four degrees, Wolf still teaches himself new skills to continue improving. If I decided to sell my company today and go out and get a new job, I can get a very lucrative job uh, just doing marketing, just doing using my digital marketing skills uh, to be able to uh, promote other companies. If you're not happy with your job, trading a couple hours of Netflix each week for a couple of hours of internet or trade school learning could eventually land you in a new role. Sean Marshall, NTD News. And more than 17,000 Etsy sellers went into vacation mode today in the start of a week-long strike. The protesting changes to seller policies the company made over the past four years with the goal of creating a union. The latest change, seller transaction fees went from 5% to 6.5% just today. The demands are listed in a letter to Etsy CEO. The petition has more than 45,000 signatures. They want the fee increase dropped, a crackdown on resellers, the option to opt out of off-site ads, and some other changes too. Etsy said the increased fees are going to address the issues outlined to the petition, including marketing, customer support, and removing listings that don't meet their policies. A spokesperson said the success of sellers is a top priority. And the fate of at least 400 leased aircraft is still in Russia remains unclear. It's after a statement by the Russian Deputy Prime Minister and reports from Russian media saying the planes will continue to fly in Russia. Indeed, Andrew Thomas is more. Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Yuri Borisov said the majority of the leased Boeing and Airbus manufactured planes will remain in Russia, even though some of them were seized abroad as Western sanctions were being introduced. Because these lessors are based in countries within the EU or in the US or, or outside of Russia, what's happening is that legally the airlines were obligated to return the aircraft. That's not what happened. The move came after Russian President Vladimir Putin passed a law allowing Russian airlines to re-register leased aircraft and continue flying them. So we ended up with hundreds of aircraft that are being kept by Russian airlines. Um, and now because of laws passed within Russia, those aircraft are being moved over from their existing registries, which were usually uh, the Bermudan registry or the Irish registry, onto the Russian registry. He says Russian airlines like Pobeda are currently keeping half their fleet on the ground to fuel the fleet in the air with spare parts. We've seen other countries make this work, um, Iran being the, the biggest example of a country affected by sanctions and unable to secure parts, um, finding ways to, to make things work. But due to required regular updates to software and electronics of Western main aircraft, Russia may have difficulties in keeping them running long term. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And more American grain growers are turning to animal ways to improve their crop yields. They're facing a global shortage of commercial fertilizers made worse by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Disfay Corda reports. Demand for manure is surging as the global fertilizer shortage made worse by the crisis in Ukraine hits farmers and producers. 
Alan Kompschneider from Nutrient Advisors said, quote, manure is absolutely a hot commodity. We've got waiting lists. He says prices in Nebraska reached as much as $14 per ton, up from a typical $5 per ton starting price. Commercial fertilizer prices are at record highs, with phosphate and potash jumping threefold and nitrogen fertilizer up fourfold since 2020. Spiraling prices for the gas and coal needed for production, extreme weather, COVID-19, and shipping snags all hit global supply. Then sanctions choked Belarus and Russia's 40% share of global potash exports. Manure is not a cure for growers who face rising prices, limited supply, high transportation costs, and environmental concerns. But it's boom time for livestock and dairy farmers, including some who previously paid to have their animal waste removed. It's also benefiting suppliers of manure drying systems, spreading equipment, and tanks known as honey wagons. And does your baby have what it takes to be the 2022 Gerber baby? Parents can now submit photos of their smiling infants in the 2022 photo search. The winner will earn the title of Spokes Baby and Chief Growing Officer. He or she will be featured on the baby food company's social media channels and then his ad campaigns throughout the year. They'll also get a $25,000 prize. For the first time this year, Gerber will match the prize with a $25,000 donation to the March of Dimes Maternal and Infant Health Programs. Gerber says that an irresistible giggle is strongly preferred in addition to an undeniable, lovable personality. Parents and guardians of kids up to four years old can submit photos and videos of their smiling and giggling to Gerber's portal before Friday. And that's the latest on the NTD business team and myself, Paul Grain. You can still catch NTD Evening News with Stephanie Cox. That's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Follow me on Twitter, too, if you're there. For NTD Business, it's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.